Hello, this is another Silver Sages Sharing Stories in interview and today I'm speaking with Lee O'Connor. Lee and her husband Paul are great adventurers, really great adventurers. They've done some amazing uh, traveling, which she'll tell you all about, and also have written a book about it. And the book really appealed to me. It's called We Did It Our Way. What more can you ask of in life? Lee, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. Now, thanks for having Thanks for having me, Jenny. It's lovely. It's lovely to meet you. And, and yeah, nice to be in this forum. Great. Wonderful. Um, I would love to know, knowing what you did do, you know, and have been doing, I would love to know what career path you and Paul started out on because you haven't been having adventures the whole way through, I don't think. Sounds to me like life has been fairly normal at one stage. Um, it, yeah, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it, we did start off with adventures right from the get go, actually, because, right. um, because, um, he, well, we met, it, it, we both brought up in rural New Zealand and, um, he, his father took him to boarding school at 12, dropped him off at the gate and said, see you at Easter. And, um, he never really went home. I mean, he, he finished school, went to uni, did a bachelor of, um, engineering and civil and, um, you know, never, never really went back to the farm, just for, mm. just for holidays and things. And um, my father took me to Auckland and said, well, we'd better get you a job. So I got a job in a typing pool within a couple of days. And then he said, well, we'll find a hostel. So he put me in a, in a girl's hostel and I happened to share a room with Paul's sister. Wow. So the first party that comes along, that, the rest is history, pretty much. Goodness me. <laughs> Yeah. So you have um, been together a long time. We've. I was sixteen when I met him. Yeah, we have been together a long time, and um, we decided we wanted to travel very early on. So I think I was about eighteen when we said we we'd like to travel together, and he said, "Well, if we're going to do that, um, we need to get married. Um, it's not. It's not good to. Yeah, I need to marry you." Will you marry me? <laughs> so, Such a romantic <laughs> fellow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we got um, married four months later and, and then we decided we'd go to Australia. We'd start our travels there. And um, it, it, in those days, it was the same price to go on a cruise ship as it was to go on an aeroplane. And for us, it was a no-brainer. We just said, let's go on the cruise ship. So we, we came to Australia on a four-day cruise across Tasman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we did, we went out to, bought a combi, went out to Ayers Rock and did right up to the Gulf and then down the coast to Melbourne. And he eventually scored a job they, and they wanted him to go up to Gladstone and build the aluminium smelter. And we both said, yeah, let's go. What's, what's stopping us? So we went up there and it ended up being four years. But it, um, what it did was it enabled us to travel without having to work. You know, in those days, yeah. everyone was going to London and working in pubs and it's not, very, it's not really very good. Um, so we were able to travel for nine months and had enough money to do it all without working. Back in, um, back in 83. So... Yeah, we actually did our first world trip back in 83. Did the Trans-Siberian Railway across Russia and um, communist at the time and ended up in America. And we drove someone else's car from New York to LA. They used okay. to have this scheme called a driveway scheme. And you, so this woman had taken a job in LA and um, she needed her car taken across. So we had 10 days to get it there. <laughs> it was a great scheme. So did you then settle down for a while? Yeah, yeah. Then we came home and had four kids um, and that all went swimmingly. It was good to be back. And Paul was building up his construction build business and with a friend from uni. And then the stock market crash happened in 87. And it was, it was sort of like a domino effect, really, in the construction business in Auckland. Yeah. So um, we, we had to start from scratch again. Um, but, you know, never to be beaten. He, he um, went back to his old contacts in Australia uh, from the aluminium smelter, so it was Bechtel, 
and they said, yep, come on over. So we decided to immigrate and he got on a job up in Lahir Island, um, which was 30 days on, 10 days off, and it meant we could fast track our way back to a bit of normality financially, but it was, it was quite hard. He, he did FIFO for many years, yeah. 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 yeah, tough times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. So, yeah. when did the bikes come into all this? Because they're a pivotal part of your story. <laughs> well, we both, when we were in Auckland working in the early days, that was the poor man's transport. You, all the uni students had bikes, mm -hmm. and it just seemed the logical thing for me to get a motorbike. Um, and so, we probably we both had three different bikes before we were twenty. Um, both had trail bikes at one stage that you could take on the beach and um, then we got married and came to Australia so that was kind of the end of bikes for the for then so uh, we, I guess Paul had a bit of a midlife crisis because he decided instead of the second car he'd get a motorbike and he kind of figured that I might be content to sit on the back and be a premium passenger <laughs> But that only lasted for three rides and I said, I'm not going to get a bike. <laughs> so we ended up with two bikes and it was actually really cool because we're both extremely passionate about riding. We, we love it. We just love it. And yeah. so it was a, a neat thing to do together. You know, we could, we could go off and do, do this together. Um, so we started doing day rides and then we found a group and we got more people into our group and we started doing, Paul and I organised overnight rides. And it was great fun. Um, and then he went and worked in Malaysia for a while. And I think it was 30 days on, 10 off. And on, his, on the weekends, he'd, he'd get one day of a weekend. And he went and found these motorcycle tour people, befriended them, and went on a few rides with them. And he said, oh, Lee, you've got to come to Malaysia. We've got to do some tours over here. It's awesome. Met these guys. So... Off we went. I, I went over and we did a tour all around Malaysia and one over to Borneo, which was fantastic. And then um, we decided to take our group back and do, do a group tour with them, which mm -hmm. was all very good. And uh, this is in 2013. And at the end of the tour, the um, Malaysian guys took us aside and said, we're putting this group together to ride overland from KL to the TT Isle of Man up through China. Do you, do you two want to come? And we just went, yeah. <laughs> Didn't even think about it, just said yes. So and what, uh, what did you do with your kids at this stage? Well, they were starting to, they were quite independent. They were traveling. Um, quite a few of them were traveling. So yeah, it was, it was nearing the end of, of that, that whole business. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, he just, he, the, the boy, Malaysian boys just said, you know, do you want to come on this, on this thing? So we just went, yeah. Came home and then looked at our motorbikes and went, well, they're not going to get to, <laughs> through China and up to the UK. They're road bikes. We need something else. So we started looking at different bikes and just, just sort of getting the idea going on in our heads, you know. Yeah. And then um, as, as the months went by, the Malaysians started pulling out. They wanted to postpone. We'd started thinking, hmm, I, you know, the time of year they want to go up through Tibet. It's really cold. Uh, we don't think they've got the timing right. And then they're going to speed across Europe. We don't know if we want to do that. So when they actually did pull out, we just said, you know, we're, we're committed. We're, get, we're going to go on our own. Um, Thank you. Why not? Yeah. And um, so, and then that way we could go when we wanted. We could choose the dates. We flagged the TT. That was all just too hard, and um, and, and started organising it. But because in 2015, when we left, uh, you have to have a guide to take if you're on your own vehicle driving or on a motorbike. You have to have a guide, and the cost is really prohibitive. In but we found. In what countries did you have to have a guide? Just in China. Okay. Yeah, just through China. So yeah. we, we, we flew the bikes to Malaysia and then rode up through Thailand and Laos to get to China. And so from the border there, we had to be met by somebody and they would escort us all the way through. Um, so we found a, um, 
uh, to a company that had people on motorbikes. So basically this guy on a bike met us at the border and became our friend for a month. We, we were there for a month and um, it was fantastic. It was just like mm -hmm. another, you know, another group. Yeah. But we, um, we, we found three other riders to join us for that, for that segment so that we could share the cost through China, um, basically. And then the other thing was, so we get to England and we've got two motorbikes what's the point of um, turning around and going home again? And what happened <laughs> between China? What happened between China and England? Where did you go through? We went through all the stands. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually lost one of our riders in Thailand. She came off. And so the journey was over for her from that point on. So we got reduced down to four people. Um, so there was three guys and me and we rode together all the way through China with our guide and then from Kazakhstan to Tajikistan we stayed together mm -hmm. um, and Paul organized all the it's quite a lot of red tape there's a lot of bureaucratic um, border crossing to do yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people that go through there get um, companies to organize it but Paul worked it all out and and it was quite he had it seamless it was amazing um, so they stayed with us till we got to Tajikistan and then we, we went our, our ways. We'd been together for four months then. It was time to, we yes. needed to be on our own at yes. that stage. So uh, no hard feelings. We all just went our own way and um, carried on. But yeah. so we did a run by ourselves and yeah, every, every, everything else after that. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And you got to England and decided that it was... Well, we, we decided before we left, we just said, what's the point of going all the way to England and then shipping the bikes back? We, why don't we just keep going? The boys were in Canada at that stage, our two mm -hmm. sons. So we, um, we just said, let's just keep going to Canada. <laughs> so we put them on an aeroplane um, at Lon in London and they ended up in Nova Scotia. And, and we just went coast to coast Canada and Thank then came you. down down through the, the whole continent. So down through America, Central America and South America. You say it all so simply. <laughs> Having been in a lot of those places, I know the red tape that is required. I also know the wonderful highs that you have, but there can also be some terrible times as well. Yeah. Uh, Travelling is not all beer and Skittles, is it? No, but it's not. What's the name of your website? <laughs> we haven't mentioned that. Bikes and Beers. <laughs> I decided I had to interview you when I saw that. But <laughs> would you share with us some of the absolute highlights, but also a few of the real challenges that you faced? Yeah. So, I mean, we went to 40 countries. We did 80,000 kilometres in 40 countries over a year. And Amazing. the absolute, absolute highlight was China, it, with no two ways about it. We still reflect on that and say, yeah, China was the standout. Um, why? Because it was so spectacular, the scenery. The people were just, I mean, yeah, you, you can... There's people, Iranians are amazing people too, but the Chinese are lovely and the food was out of the park. Mm. I'm a bit of a foodie, so I just love the Chinese food. And it's not like you get in a Chinese restaurant in Australia um, and it's, if we didn't have Mr. Wan, our guide, ordering for us, it wouldn't have been good either. Yes. But he, he, there's 56 minority groups in, in China and he made sure that we tried food from every minority group to give you Goodness. an idea. Goodness. So every, t every time we stopped, he would order four or five courses. And then with, you know, he had an English app on his phone and him and I would sit there and discuss the food <laughs> because uh, it just blew me out of the water how, how good it was. Mm. It was so good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we really, really enjoyed China. Uh, there were so many aspects to it. The, the scenery would change. We went through the Gobi Desert and rode through a sandstorm. That was interesting. Um, and, you know, just seeing the Great Wall, the proper Great Wall, not the tourist Great Wall in Beijing. Um, yeah, just so many 
aspects of it. We thought we'd seen it all. And then just before we crossed to Kazakhstan, we came upon this lake. And um, Mr. Wan, he hadn't, even, he hadn't even been to this lake. And we, he, he stopped us on the side of the road. He said, do you want to go there? And we went, yeah, okay. So the four of us, we, the five of us shot off around this lake. And it was just, it was like the, the jewel on the crown. How beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And the other standout country would have to be Peru. Um, for motorcycle riding and just, you know, Machu Picchu. And it, it was just a uh, yeah, very, very cool place to be on a motorbike. Lots of and, very good riding. And some difficult times, some challenges that you faced? So when we came down through Mexico, we crossed um, south of Tucson and it's, it becomes third world immediately. So you've come, we've been in the first world since Greece. So we've come right across Europe, the UK and um, Canada and America. And now we're in <laughs> Mexico and we're back to third world again. And yeah. so what happens is when they do something like roadworks, they just carve a little path off to the right and overnight, the rains, the, the skies had opened and the rains had turned it into an absolute quagmire. And I, we came upon it and, of course, you, you can't read the lingo, so we didn't know how long it was going to go for, not that the signs would have told you that anyway. Um, but we, we, you know, got onto this deviation and, and started heading off and the big, huge brown lakes... So I got off the bike and said to Paul, I can't, I can't do it and my legs aren't long enough. I'm, I'm just going to come off. Anyway, he got my bike through and then he said, we don't know how long it's going to go for. You've got to ride. You've got to do it. So I got on and off I go. Well, the, the road tapered down and um, this car comes around a corner skidding sideways towards me. Anyway, my bike fishtailed and over I went. Oh dear. And I'd been watching him stupidly. I'd been watching him and he had his legs down in the mud. And that you shouldn't. He can do that because he's got long legs. I don't. So I, I pinned my leg under my aluminium pannier. Oh, dear. And of course, yeah, I was quite a ways ahead of him at that point. And so I'm lying down in the mud with, you know, 220 kilos of bike on top of me and I can't move. Oh. No one wanted to stop because it's, it's muddy. And so I'm just lying there writhing and carrying on. And eventually he, he came up behind me, jumps off, runs over and then bikes off me. But um, yeah, very quickly became serious because I had a crushed, crushed ankle. So um, we got taken, the police arrived <laughs> and I got taken to a little medical centre um, but of course, we're, it's third world, it's bush, they didn't have an x-ray, they suspected a fracture, but they didn't have an x-ray machine. So they, all we could understand was ambulance, USA, and we're going, oh my God, you know. So Paul had to, to go and do something with the bikes. So <laughs> And check the health insurance was okay. <laughs> well, you couldn't even think about anything like that. So... Yeah. Um, he just went and got the bikes and took them into the village and uh, managed, <laughs> I don't know how it all got arranged, but he managed to get them locked up in a jail cell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's um, quite a character. Yeah, yeah. So they, they got safely put in a jail cell. He, he signed a handwritten, you know, form to say that's where they were and we would, we would pay them $500 when we came to collect them whenever that was. And then he came back and joined me in, with, in the ambulance and then they drove us back to the border. They Apparently they had a chopper waiting to take me to a hospital. It was all over, overkill. Um, but we swapped ambulances. I got in an American ambulance and got taken to the nearest hospital. And the first x-ray said, yes, it was a fracture at two in the morning. Um, so we rang Paul's sister, who lived in Tucson. She came and picked us up, and we ended up back at her place. She didn't think she'd see us again. And the next day, we went into the local hospital. I had another X-ray, and it wasn't broken. So basically, I had ten days off, and um, and then just had to get on with it. Weren't you, know, you lucky just... that you had family so close by? Oh, I know, I know. It was it was very lucky. 
and um, so that was a godsend. But it, it it was difficult. My my leg wouldn't. My brain. I couldn't make the brain function the leg like I needed to, and it was my break leg. So. Um, oh. Yeah, it, it did present difficulties for a while and it was painful. You know, we'd get somewhere to a destination and Paul would say, come on, let's go walk uptown for dinner. And I, I it was sore. So, yeah, um, yeah it, that kind of made it difficult. We were tired by that stage. We'd been on the road for a long time and yeah. we were back in third world. Everything seemed to be difficult. But we'd always said, you know, if it, if it gets to that point where we're not enjoying it, um, or, you know, for whatever reason, we can always put the bikes on a, on a plane or a boat and go home. We don't have yeah. to carry on. But we're also <laughs> Irish heritage. We're very stubborn. <laughs> neither, of, neither of us wanted to pull the pin. So we just, we just worked, worked through it. And, yeah. Um, yeah, once we got out of Mexico, it seemed to lift for us. Um, yeah, once we headed, got south of Mexico, we seemed to come right again. And we were, you know, we're, we're so glad we did because there was so much more to see. Yes, yeah. yes. What about political situations in the countries you were in? You went through some, lots of places that had... Um, we came up the border of, of Iraq. We did Kurdistan, which is, which is a province... Um, to the west of Iran, so it, it then skirts up the side of Iraq. So we were we were within twelve k's of the of the Iraqi border, and you could see the the border guards up on the hills. But you know, every now and then a guard would just pop out of the bush on the side of the road. But you never felt threatened. They were there to look after you. They weren't there to to um, be a threat to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we got up into Turkey, there was a lot of refugee camps along yes. the, along the road but i mean they weren't they weren't an issue coming into colombia and in south america uh we'd been warned about one particular road that we were going to go on that was i guess in the past had been purportedly you know yeah. a drug drug highway but they really cleaned colombia up so same deal there was a lot of military on the road and they just wave put their thumbs up they always thought it was great when they saw that I was a woman on a bike and you know they put their thumbs up and we I think the most unsafe we felt was in Mexico yeah um yeah in the north of Mexico it's very very the drug running is very current there there's no we saw a lot of guns um you know, we'd come up behind a vehicle and there'd be a machine gun and a whole row of people sitting there with guns. It was quite intimidating in some ways because you're thinking, what are they looking out for? You know, you're yeah. riding along, looking at the countryside, going, what are they actually going to shoot? Yeah. yeah. It's not going to be us. Hopefully not me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's quite an amazing adventure. I'm so looking forward to getting your book and reading it. Um, tell me just from a... A family perspective. What did the kids all say when you said you were going to do this trip? <laughs> it's funny you say that because when you when we started planning it, we would we'd say to people, "Oh, we're thinking of riding our motorbikes over to England," and they'd go, "Hi, oh, yeah." <laughs> you know, people don't believe you. Yeah. They just think they just think you're making conversation. And it <laughs> wasn't it wasn't until we actually said. In May 2015, we're going to ride around the world on our motorbikes. And they, were, they, they took it seriously. It was suddenly, people took it seriously. The yeah. kids were extremely proud of us. Um, our youngest daughter, she, she tells the story. She was at a party and um, I, I must have rung in from some country. And so she took me away to a quiet corner and she's chatting to me. And she came back and everyone was teasing her. Is that your mom? You know, you're talking to your mom. You're at a party. You know, what are you doing yeah. talking to your mum? And she, she blasted them. She said, don't you? <laughs> My parents are legends, she said. They're, <laughs> they're riding their motorbikes around the world. Don't you talk to me about parents. And <laughs> shut them up. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. she, was, she was in Melbourne when we arrived home. So she flew up to meet us. Um, so her and our other daughter were both at the airport to meet us when we first flew in. Lovely. Um, I reckon we were a bit smelly. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. That would have been the least of your worries at that stage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 
You said to me on the phone the other day when we were speaking that Paul is perhaps retiring fairly soon. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do with your retirement? Because I'll bet it won't be playing croquet and doing chess. <laughs> well, there will be a bit of that. Um, <laughs> I think, like, it was quite funny. He ran into somebody through work the other day, a woman, and um, this, this story came out that we'd written a book and we'd done this journey. And her first words to Paul, she looked at him and she went, wow, how do you come down from that? Mm. And it, re it really resonated with him. He, said, he came home and said to me, it's, it's such a pertinent thing to say, isn't it? How, how yeah. do you come down? that and um when you so when you talk about retirement a trip like a journey like that an adventure you don't really come down totally because it's changed you yes. but you how we see it is we're on a mission you know like if you retire at 65 you've only really got till you're 75 you're only you're only fit if you do a survey on all your friends that are over 70 you can see they're starting to not travel so much and yeah. they're not as agile and they're this and that. So from 65 to 75, you gotta, you got to jam it in. <laughs> and so we say to our friends, you know, make a list up. You'd be surprised if you start making a list of what you'd like to do between 65 and 75 and then work out how many summers you've got. Because you, usually you do the things in the summer. So it's 10 summers. How you, are you going to fit everything in in those 10 summers? If you can afford it and you, you're smart, you can double up because you can hit the Northern Hemisphere summers as well. <laughs> but, well, when there's not a pandemic. Yes. Um, so you could double, double your summers there, but you, you, you know what I'm saying? You, you've, only got a, you've only got a certain amount of time. And, we're quite amazed at how many of our friends don't see the urgency in that. Mm. They, they're, 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 I suppose complacence one word, but they're just happy. They're mulling along. Some people don't want to do things, and that's yeah. fine. But, but for us, yeah, we've got a definite list, and and the adventure things we want to get done in the first five. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you leave the the things that don't require so much energy for the for the last five i suppose and it's not saying you rule rule life out for a time and after 75 but there really does seem to be that period where you've got to jam it in you know yeah yeah um well, what, what are so you yeah. on doing what are the adventures you've got ahead <laughs> well we were supposed to be going to greece and italy in september yeah. um yeah. we're now looking um so to ride motorbikes. So that's now looking at the end of May next year, if it happens, I, I'm not sure. We, it's all an unknown for everybody. We want to do a month long um, tour, motorbike tour in Africa, because we didn't, that was one continent we didn't do. When we went around the world, you had to choose a route. Yeah. And we either, you know, spent another few months doing the whole of Africa or we just went across the top. So. Yeah. Um, We'd like to go back and do Africa. And then we'd also like to go back to America because America's fabulous riding. Um, so that's the motorcycle side of things. <laughs> and we'd like to do walks. We want to get down to Tassie and do some walks down there while we still can. Yeah. Um, so we've bought a camper and it, it's looking like at this stage, I mean, Victoria's shut down again now. So we were thinking of going to Tassie next year, but... I don't think I don't think that's going to be on the cards. Mm. So we'll we'll just take it as it comes. We've just bought a couple of kayaks <laughs> to go on the roof. We've yep. got some e on the back, so lots of um, activity. And you know, there's plenty to see in Australia. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, Lee, it's you're quite inspirational, really. That's just fantastic to hear of all the things that you've done. I'll be sharing on the blog post about your book, etc., uh, so people know how they can read more about it. And uh, I just thank you so much for talking with us and for, I think, giving us all the push to get out there and start doing adventures and having more, having more fun. 
I think yeah. we all feel at the moment just a little bit pulled back on our fun levels and it's just wonderful to hear of the things that you've been doing. It's, um, it, thank you, Jenny. No, it's been a pleasure to, to have you. I think the, the key thing there is count your summers. Yeah. <laughs> Work yeah. out what you want to do and count those summers. That is fabulous advice for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you.